the tools are very fundamental. Spanners, ring spanners, open end spanners, but the specialty tools. Most of the tools that you'd use for that would be a hacksaw, files, uh, a double cut 10 inch bastard file would be probably one of the most popular files. For sure. Well, it's meant to be the waiter's friend, but sometimes it can be the waiter's enemy, especially if you don't have very much experience with this odd contraption. Big hammer, I suppose. <laughs> but they have to be really sharp, they're used for everything. Um, cutting leather, skiving leather. It's called a ruffler and it's a sewing machine attachment and you fit it onto your machine and you can actually make the fabric ruffle, put little tucks and pleats into the fabric. Oh, that's, that's a, what they call a hoof knife, that is. That's for, for pairing and uh, doing work on horses' hooves. Mmm, sharp now. It's sharp. Um, well, you use it to cut bones. You know, chopping through bones and sort of things that won't damage. If you use your knife on, on bones, it'll just damage the edge of it, so, you know, it's holding up, whereas a cleaver doesn't really matter. And the very last is the nipple key. Tightening the spokes. It is, it is a strange looking little thing. <laughs> it's got a little... Uh... They've been in existence since the mm, year dot, basically. Yeah. And uh, not a great deal of things have changed as far as the... A, an updated version on an old theme. <laughs> but uh, it'd be pretty hard to replace these ones. I'm so used to them. They're really smooth now because the, um, they've been used so often that the, the metal's quite polished. Oh, you polished. get comfortable with the, with the tool, yeah, yeah, for sure. And if, you, if you lose it or break it, it's very hard to replace because it feels comfortable in your hand and everything feels balanced about it. But, when you've got to replace a tool, it's very difficult to get that same balance into another new tool. My torch. This is my torch. You use the torch for looking in people's ears Put a nice little cone on it. And you hold somebody's ear up. And if it's a child, you make some corny remark about Tana and Gregor's, Gregor's garden. And usually, if it's an adult, the adult will make some corny remark about seeing through the other side. You know, pretty delicate looking. Makes nice noises. Like, it's nice. Those ones are sort of nice noise. This one's much harsher noise. The equipment I like using the most is the vise. Because it's, uh, it's very intricate. You can get any ang angle or tension you want on it. And it's the centre point to the whole tying activity. It holds the hook just exactly the way you want it. It is quite a delight to use it. When I've had it on, you know, public exhibition, well, people uh, queue up to be able to just turn the handle. The thrill of being able to turn the handle on it and see the circular saw going. This is a collection of, of antique machines going back 150, 200 years. You see, what happened to machines like this, they were pulled out of service probably 70 or 80 years ago and uh, put aside and then someone might have been looking for a reinforcement for a concrete wall and that's where a lot of these sorts of things finished up. The people from the Department of Labor and Industry would have a blue fit if they saw something like this. They could see danger with the exposure of the blade and all that sort of thing. I think the tool that most labels a doctor is the stethoscope. Because from the time you get your first stethoscope when you're a medical student, it gives you a sense of prestige. And that's why medical students walk around with them dangling out of their pockets or around their necks, you see, like that. And even now, that I have been practicing for 25 years and I shove it in my coat pocket, 
I don't always tuck it entirely in my coat pocket. I sometimes leave a little bit dangling, dangling or the ear piece is poking out because it's no doubt it does label you. That is what being a doctor is all about, having the stethoscope. some of my favourite tools that I use in my profession, which have been used for time and memorial. They basically haven't changed since the last couple of hundred years. We have, except for the materials used these days, these are called parallel rules. In the olden days they used to be made of wood or ivory, and they were referred to known as clickety plaques, as you can see. They're called parallel rules. And this is actually what we draw a line off on the chart, or course. And I don't like this tool because to use it the woman is lying on the bed all curled up in fetal position with her back to him. And I think to approach someone from somebody from behind with a tool like this if you're going to insert in their vagina is the most unpleasant process. As useful as it might be. This is what we use all the time for taking off wheels and undoing tight bolts and things like that. It just plugs into the air, air um, compressor and uh, it sort of takes a lot of the work out of um, undoing things that are really tight. It's called a bivalve speculum. Not a pleasant tool. Designed by men in their own image. I have no doubt about that. Divine, designed by Frenchmen actually. Also to look in women's vaginas. At least the woman is looking at you lying on her back. It's not quite such an assaulting tool, that one. It will clack a lot, doesn't it? And uh, what it does is it takes the hook in the end and then you get a little bobbin or a, a, a holder for the yarn, you wind the bit on like that and then you'll get a, a feather or whatever you want to tie in and bind that onto the hook and then you start to do your fly tying. This is my own sectum, it's worth about $3,000 and what does this do is measures the altitude of the heavenly body above the horizon if I put my eye up to here and look at the heavenly body, which could be a star or a sun or the moon, and by bringing it down to the horizon by this here, this tells me how many degrees it is above the horizon in minutes. By moving this here, all I do is this, this go down like that. And when I get to the horizon, the lower limb, which is the lower part of the body, a rocket to make sure, and I can find adjustment on here. Strictly speaking, a tool is something you use to assist the activity. That's how Jean Goodall defined a tool when she was talking about chimpanzees using a stick to dig with. She was very impressed with the fact that they used a tool. So I always regard my books as my tools and I love my books. And I love the journals and I love reading, I love the use of those things as tools. My hands are really important because you can ascertain a lot from just observing and by watching and hearing, but with touch I'm able to experience more about what is the quality of the body and what is maybe under strain inside the body or what, where there is a lack or an inhibition in the body and that it's only through touch that I can experience that. And it seems that the lighter the touch, the more space there is for me to be able to interpret. If the touch is more directive, it becomes something that I I have in me and am trying to produce in another person and sometimes that can be useful but 
more often than not, it is better to actually be very light with touch. The way that I interpret what's occurring in a one-to-one -one situation is a combination of developed skill and intuition and the capacity to be present for that person. And so from that position I can then possibly interpret something. It becomes a relationship and that's where I see it very much to do with movement and dance that that there is movement in the body of the person and there's movement in me and that it's that relationship between those two bodies and that is where the hands are really important because it becomes both uh, a receptor and, a res and I have the capacity to receive back through the body. So there is a proprioceptive capacity within both bodies and that's where the touch and the hands become really important then the hands become an interpretive tool. This one here, uh, commonly known in, in, in our workshop as the de-virginizer and it's used for um, sliding CV boots, like rubber boots, onto drive shafts and you've got a small hole in the end of a rubber boot about that big and it's got to be stretched right out over this end and you have to put them in hot water and you probably sometimes need two people to stretch and pull them right down over the end of that. The favourite materials I like using are these very, very fine hackle feathers because uh, to tie one of those onto a fly and make one of these beautiful little hackles that causes the fly to float well and help, helps tricks the trout, tricks the trout because they look like wings that are beating when they settle on the water. That's a very intriguing part of fly tying, and you do it out of one single little feather like that. When you look at a machine like this, you, you can't help but be uh, amazed of how they can do a one-piece casting. That whole frame is one, one piece, and uh, the patterns and Box work to be required to do a casting like that would be, uh, it'd be very really hard to do today. Most of the mach machines in this room are illustrated in this fine old catalogue. Um, for instance, there is the picture of the bandsaw we're just using. and shall be pleased to communicate with any address that may happen to be situated between the equator and either of the poles. I think that's rather delightful. You can just imagine some gentleman sitting on a high stool penning this out in London somewhere. You can put this little bit on and you can look in somebody's eyes with this one, which is somewhat more interesting than ears. A lot of the tools, apart from the stethoscope, go in people's orifices. The eye, you only look in the orifice, of course. The thermometer, you stick in somebody's mouth. They're lovely things, really, to touch. The mercury is always fascinating. Always reminds me of my mother when I shake it down with a flick like that. I quite like it. And I think the thing about it is not just that it's prestigious and peculiar to medical practitioners, but that it's not invasive. You can apply it to somebody's naked chest and you can hear and understand and imagine what's going on inside. And in no way do you have to shove it in anybody's orifice. And in that
that way, it is the most beautiful thing. And if there is a reason why I would be fond of this tool and not fond of these tools, it is because it's non-invasive. When you actually put it on the chest and you put these things in your ears, you are creating a link between your patient and yourself. Your patient's illness and your understanding of it. And there is something very precious about that. A linking tool, not an invading tool. It's for um, using on the press to press things out, and it's made of bronze or, or copper, so it um, you know, doesn't damage any harder metals. And I just love the shape of it because it used to be just a straight piece of steel, and it's just mushroomed out over the years. <laughs> it's just really incredible shape. It um, just for blowing things off, for drying things, or blowing out. Um, small holes or crevices in carburetors or things like that and it's um, sometimes you know people don't know how to use it it's no obvious way of making it blow air through but you actually just bend it and uh, 